All right. <clears throat> uh, as I said, we're, tonight we're wrapping up this series on, on making those lasting changes in our lives. And tonight's message is probably the most important of all four of them. Uh, so it's a good thing you're here tonight. Okay. Uh, this series has been about implementing strategies to create lasting changes in your life. In week one, we talked about thinking for a change. Ephesians 4.23 says that, that you are to be made new in the attitude of your minds. And what Paul's saying is that we need to learn to think the right thoughts. Every thought will take you in one of three directions. It will either lead you to a negative action or it will lead you to inaction or to a positive action. The first two aren't going to help you at all. We need to think the kind of thoughts that will steer us in the direction of doing what is right. Paul said in Philippians 4.8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, praiseworthy think about such things. And if we'll consistently run our thoughts through those eight filters, true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, then we're going to get in the habit of thinking thoughts of victory and success rather than failure and defeat. You can't just positive think your way to a better life, but you can action think your way there. So get in the habit of thinking the kind of thoughts that are going to lead you to take the actions that you need to take. It's a pretty simple process. When you catch yourself dwelling on a certain type of thought, ask yourself, will this kind of thinking take me where I want to go? If not, then reject it. Get rid of it and start thinking better thoughts. This is what Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians 10.5 when he said, taking every thought captive and making it obedient to Christ. So do you want to create a change in your life? Then think a new way. Not just sometimes, not just when it's easy, but all the time. Week two, I called do something different for a change. And we took a look at procrastination because procrastination is the enemy of change. James tells us, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Most of us know what we need to do. We just put off doing it for as long as we can. Maybe it's because we have a fear of failure or a fear of success or a fear of hard work. Or maybe we just don't feel like doing what we ought to do. What we looked at is that feelings always follow actions. And if you'll do what you ought to do, it won't be long before you begin to feel like you want to feel. I suggested that, that when you're tempted to procrastinate, put in at least 10 minutes worth of effort and see if you don't feel that momentum start to swing. Procrastination is based on a lie. I tend to procrastinate the most when I'm thinking, what's the use? Nothing I do really makes that much of a difference anyway. You won't think that way if you apply the lessons from week one to your thought life. You'll learn to think with a new perspective, like David thought when he faced Goliath. He more or less said, this giant ain't no match for the power of God. Why are we wasting time with him? This is a battle that we can win. <clears throat> so let's do it. Each of us can have that same kind of attitude. Overcoming procrastination puts you in charge of your life. And that's a great feeling. Take it from a recovering procrastinator. Week three was called taking responsibility for a change. We have a tendency to want to blame outside forces for our situation. It's my wife's fault, or it's the economy's fault. 
It's my boss's fault, or my competitor's fault, or the customer's fault, or my mom and dad's fault, and on and on. But when you take responsibility for where you are in life, you empower yourself to move forward. We have to let go of our tendency to make excuses and to let go of our tendency to place blame. We need to take responsibility for those things over which we do have control. What are those? Your thoughts, your words, and your actions. Take responsibility for your life means that you say, I'm going to think right, I'm going to talk right, and I'm going to do right. Now, you can't control the weather, you can't control other people, or the government, or the rest of the world, but do you know what? You don't need to. If you take charge of your words, your thoughts, and your actions, you can create the life that you want. Taking responsibility is about taking initiative. It's about saying, I'm not going to sit around waiting for someone else to come along and fix my life. I'm going to do today what needs to be done. Now, that's where we've been so far in this series. Creating change is about maximizing the connection between thought and action. Tonight, which again I think is the most important message, it, it, it is because it's the most challenging step in the process for creating change. Tonight's message I've called sticking around for a change. And, and, and it's at this point that the new leaf that you've turned over fails to become a new life because you give up too soon. We tend to want to see immediate results and when we don't get them, we go back to the old way of life. I've known people who tried to lose weight before and after a week of starving themselves and working out to the point of exhaustion, they gave up because they didn't lose a single pound. For those of us who struggle with our weight, we need to remember that we didn't get chubby overnight. This didn't happen overnight, okay? So we're not going to get skinny overnight either. This just doesn't happen. It's a process that takes time, and it's a process that you have to stay involved in. This applies not only to your weight and to your physical health, but it applies to your spiritual life, your relationships, your finances, your business, in every area of life. For those who want desperately to make improvements in certain areas of their lives, it could be that in four, five, or six weeks, maybe even four, five, or six months, you'll find yourself tempted to think, why am I doing this? I'm not making any progress. I feel like I'm just spinning my wheels and wasting my time. I might as well just give up. And that's what most people do. They say, I gave it my best shot. And they quit. And their life stays the same. But for that select few who say, I refuse, to give up. Eventually, their efforts pay off. Eventually, they see the results that they're looking for. Eventually, their lives become permanently better. Why? Because they locked in on the right path and the right strategy, and they stayed with it until payday. Paul said to the Galatians in Galatians 6 verse 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Now, right before he wrote those words, he explained the law of the harvest. If you jump back to verse 7 here in Galatians 6, he said, a man reaps what he sows. In other words, if you plant corn, you harvest corn. If you plant daisies, you're going to harvest daisies. 
you always harvest what you plant. Today, in your financial life, in your emotional life, in your spiritual life, in your family life, in your business, with your physical health, you're reaping the harvest that you planted in the weeks and months and years past. And that continues throughout your life. At different times, you reap different harvests, all based on what you planted. So to change what you reap, you need to change what you sow. Paul said in Galatians 6, 8, whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And then from there, he goes on to say what I read first in verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Here's what I believe that he's saying. If you'll do what you ought to do day after day after day, eventually your ship's going to come in. Your payday will arrive and you'll experience that windfall of blessings when you reap the harvest. Now some of you might say, you know what, I've tried that. I'm trying it now. And the hardest part is just hanging in there between the time of sowing and the time of reaping, waiting for the harvest to come in. And I agree with you. It's hard to keep on keeping on. But it's much easier to quit. That's why for the last three weeks, I've been trying to lay some kind of a groundwork for the path that you need to follow. To learn how to think empowering thoughts. To learn how to beat procrastination. To learn how to take responsibility for your life. Those prepare you for the task of perseverance. So here are some things that are going to help you not get weary in doing good. Hopefully, they'll keep you on the right path. They'll prevent you from going back to the way things used to be. And they'll enable you to stay faithful until you reap the harvest that God has in store for you. So here are three perseverance-building habits that you need to develop. The first one is, put the past and everything that belongs to it behind you once and for all. Now, when I say everything that belongs to it, what specifically am I talking about? Well, guilt, for one thing. Guilt belongs in the past. It has no place in the present. If you've done things that are wrong, and all of us fall into that category, if you've done things for which you're ashamed, things that brought pain into your life and into the lives of others, then it's only natural that you're going to feel guilty about those things. But the guilt has no right to, 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 to permanently reside in your mind. I've known some people over the years that have told me about how bad they were when they were young adults. How they did things that they knew were wrong and how they seemed to do everything that they could in their life to destroy the relationships that they had with their parents and friends and spouses. And then they've spent the next 20 years of their lives wallowing in the guilt of what they had done. It was like they couldn't allow themselves to be happy at all because they couldn't forgive themselves for the way that they had acted or treated the loved ones that they had in the past. Were they wrong to do what they initially did? Yes, absolutely. And all of them needed to acknowledge the full weight of their actions. But after acknowledging that and after confessing their sin, 
which many of them had already done, they needed to accept the forgiveness that's in Christ. And they needed to forgive themselves and they needed to move on. Isaiah 38, 17 tells us that God turns His back on our sins and that He forgets our sins and He remembers them no more. We need to do the same thing. We need to be able to say, that was the old me, that was my old life, that's not who I am anymore. When I worked for the park board in Wichita, which I've talked about several times, one of the parks that, that I was over was in downtown Wichita, Kansas. It was called Nafsker Park, named after this guy who had was a, one of the founders of, of Wichita way back when and, and had a bank and all that kind of stuff. He gave a lot of money uh, to the city, but his last name was Nafsker. So, so Nafsker Park is where I was. It was affectionately known as Wino Park. <laughs> Guess what? There were several, several regulars, I guess you could say, at the park that I had the opportunity to chat with over time. Guys who, who were there every day, and as I walked around, as I did stuff and took care of things, there were times that, that, you know, that I would chat with some of them. And I asked one of them once why he was an alcoholic. Because he was. He was there every day. He was, he was a wino. You know, that may not be the politically correct term anymore, but that's what he was. And that's what he called himself. But I asked him why he was an alcoholic. And he said that it started as a way of escape. He said that he knew that it was wrong, but he felt so guilty about what he had done to his family and to his life that he just had to take another drink to help himself endure the shame. And then he felt both bad about that, that he'd take another drink, and another, and another. The past has a way of haunting us. Even if your past isn't full of, of ugly sin, it can cause all kinds of trouble. It reminds us again and again of everything that we've lost and all that we've missed out on. It tells us again and again that the future can never be as good as the past might have been if only we had done things differently. When the past haunts you in that way, you're often tempted to give up. You're tempted to say, what's the use? Why even try? I'll never be the person that I ought to be. Paul's response was much different. He had a past as well. He had a past to try to get past and to forget as well. Paul said in Philippians 3, 13 through 14, Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heaven. I call in Christ Jesus. But Paul, weren't you a sinner? Forgetting what is behind, he said. But Paul, weren't you, by your own admission, the chief of sinners? He's back there. Forgetting what is behind, he says. But Paul, weren't you complicit in a murder? Forgetting what is behind is what he said. 
I guarantee you that there are going to be some people who will never forget your past and will never let you forget your past. They will forever judge based on what you did in the past, in your old life. They'll say, you know, you have always had a ferocious temper or you've always been irresponsible or you've always been selfish. And then they're going to say, and you're always going to be that way. Don't listen to them. Don't believe them. Those things may have been true at one point, but they don't have to be true today. God can change you through and through, and he will change you. Let go of the past. Put it behind you, along with all the guilt and shame and regrets and what ifs, and press on toward the goal that God has called you to. Secondly, as long as there's time on the clock, keep trying. Most of us love comeback stories. We watch movies based on actual events and we get warm fuzzies and, 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 and even shed a tear. Maybe. Most of the time, Comeback stories are based in the area of sports. So I looked up a few, and these are two that came to the top. The 2004 Boston Red Sox. They were behind three games to none in the American League Championship Series. No team had ever come back from a three-game deficit to win the pennant. And at this point, many teams accept their defeat and just phone in the nine innings of that fourth game. But the Red Sox knew that until the fourth loss was officially in the books, it was still anybody's series. And they did the impossible. They won the last four games of the championship series, and they went on to win the World Series for the first time in more than 85 years. It was possibly one of baseball's greatest comebacks. And then there's the Music City Miracle. In the first NFL playoff game of the 21st century on January 8th of the year 2000, with 16 seconds left on the clock, the Buffalo Bills kicked what appeared to be the game-winning field goal. All they had to do was kick the ball to the Tennessee Titans and wait for those last few seconds to run out. And at this point, most receiving teams would probably resort to some sort of desperation play. But Tennessee came on the field with a plan a fully diagrammed play, and it worked. The Titans scored, they won the game, and they went on to win the Super Bowl. The principle here is that as long as there's time on the clock, you need to keep trying. Proverbs 24, 16 says, Though a righteous man falls seven times, he will get up, but the wicked will stumble into ruin. I'm sure that there have been many times over the years when either as a result of your own foolishness or the result of circumstances around you that you've gotten knocked down. And in those moments, what you need to do is remind yourself that the difference between being righteous and wicked. The difference between being a wise man 
or a fool, according to Scripture, is determined by whether or not you get up and try again. Because we all get knocked down. The wicked get give up, but the righteous get up. That's the difference. Sir Barton was a 16th century high admiral who sailed the seas on behalf of the Scottish crown. He was considered a hero by some and a pirate by others. He was eventually captured by the British. And there's an old English ballad called, oddly enough, the Ballad of Sir Andrew Barton. And it describes his whole life. This poem is 82 stanzas long. I do not encourage you to just read it. Okay? But among them, you're going to find three lines that say this. I am hurt, but I am not slain. I'll lay me down and bleed a while. Then I'll rise to fight again. It's very similar, I think, to the idea that Paul talked about centuries before in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9, when he said, we are pressured in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but we're not destroyed. Paul saying, we get knocked down, but we're not knocked out. We get knocked down, but we need to get up and try again. And I want you to know that, that there's a lot of power in that second try. Or third try. Or fourth try. Or fifth try. You may feel like that you're getting weaker every time you fail, but the fact is that every time you get back up on your feet, you build a little more emotional muscle, and you develop the habit of perseverance. And this is the result. Romans 5, verses 4 and 5, says endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given to us. If you're, if you're ever tempted to say, I sometimes feel so hopeless, I just don't have the strength to give it anymore, then remember the most half-hearted second attempt will always outdo the most energetic act of quitting. As long as there's still time on the clock, stay in the game. And here's the third thing that you can do. Seek out those who can help you. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 4 verses 9 and 10, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. God made us to be together, to work together, to serve together, to laugh and to cry together. We're not made to be alone. We need one another. I know this sounds kind of strange to think about, but even the Lone Ranger had Tonto. <laughs> Here are three types of people that we need to look for in our lives. Look for those who can give you advice based on wisdom. Proverbs 16, 20, the first half of that says, whoever gives heed to instruction prospers. 
We also need to look for those who can speak the truth in love. Proverbs 27, 6 says, The wounds of a friend are trustworthy, but the kisses of an enemy are excessive. Solomon's talking about those who love you enough to say what you need to hear even when it hurts to hear it. Those words are a whole lot better than flattery from those who aren't really committed to your well-being at all. And lastly, we need to look for those who recognize your potential. There's a good possibility that there are some people in your life who certainly love you, but they don't really believe in you. Truth be told, they think you'll always be fat, or you'll always be broke. You'll always be an underachiever. Now this group may include your parents, your siblings, your spouse, your extended family, maybe even some lifelong friends. They may love you, but they're not capable of recognizing your potential. This doesn't mean that you need to get rid of them out of your life, but it does mean that you should learn to take their attitude with a grain of salt. Love them back, but don't believe everything that they believe. When Jerry Seinfeld told his family that he wanted to be a comedian, his mother and his sister both said to him, but Jerry, you're not funny. <laughs> and you'll never be as funny as your dad. Now no doubt they loved him, but they didn't really believe in him because they never recognized his potential. There are a handful of people in my life who, when I talk to them, they fill me with hope. And there are a handful of people in my life who, when I talk to them, I have to fight the urge to not get depressed. Guess who I like to talk to more often? Look for those who recognize your potential and let them speak encouragement into your life. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. Spiritually mature believers will seek to build you up. Spiritually immature Believers find it easier to tear you down, especially when you're already down. Don't listen to them. Listen instead to those who know what they're talking about. We're in this thing for the long haul, and we can't get to where we're going all by ourselves. We need others to help us along the way. So seek out those who can give you good advice and who are willing to speak the truth gently in love and who are both discerning enough to recognize your potential and spiritual enough to build you up when you need it the most. Those kinds of people are a gift to you from God. Make sure that they know as well how much you appreciate them. For four weeks now, we've been talking about and looking at creating lasting change in your life. It's not an overnight process. It doesn't happen with a snap of your fingers. It's a process of sowing and then reaping. You plant the right thoughts, the right words, the right actions, and you reap the harvest of blessing. If, as the Apostle Paul says, if you do not give up. There are forces at work in this world to persuade you to give up. The past, for example, 
will tell you that you don't deserve success or happiness or forgiveness or God's blessings. But the past is a liar. It doesn't control the future. Put the past and all that belongs to it behind you. Also, frustration and failure will tell you that it's pointless to go on, that you may as well give up now. But failure is a misperception when there's still time on the clock. You may be down for the moment, but you can get back up. The secret of success is simply standing up one more time than you fell down. Also, well-meaning people, and some not so well-meaning people, will try to convince you that you're not cut out to live the life of your dreams. Don't listen to them. Listen instead to those who have the wisdom to speak into your life, who have the compassion to speak the truth in love and who have the spiritual maturity to recognize your potential. Seek those people out and let them be a source of strength in your life. The only way to create lasting change in your life is to plant the right harvest and hang in there until the harvest actually comes in. Don't get weary in doing well, in doing good. God is faithful. Your blessing is on the way. If you want to change and keep that change, keep at it until lasting change actually comes your way. Take out your prayer sheets.